So thanks for coming to our talk. Um, if anyone was here earlier, Dan McKinley and Courtney Buckley kind of set the scene for conservation in the Battenkill watershed. And um, a group of us, myself, Jacob Fetterman, Jim Henderson, John Braco, and Joe Mark are here to tell a little bit more of the conservation story in the Battenkill watershed. And um, as you might know already or are getting to know, conservation is not a one person or one entity job. It relies on a lot of critical partnerships to complete the work that we're doing. And so I have up here probably uh, still a very short list of all the critical partners to the work that we're doing in the Battenkill watershed, ranging from the local communities, the towns, all the way up to the federal entities, um, the US Forest Service and US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, everyone from the local community all the way up there, critical members, and um, the work we're doing would not be possible without those partnerships. And for me specifically, I work for Trout Unlimited National. And um, if you're familiar with TU, you might ha know about the idea of Home Rivers Initiatives, but basically they're projects of TU to bring dedicated resources to really important waters. Um, so some of the other Home Rivers Initiatives out there are on well-known rivers like the Gallatin, the Potomac, um, the Upper Snake, they have one, and the Upper Delaware. So there's Home Rivers Initiatives kind of spread out across the country. And what a Home Rivers Initiative is, like I kind of mentioned already, um, TU National is kind of identifying these watersheds, these areas as critical habitat and those that we want to protect, reconnect, restore, so that the trout that are there can thrive for years and years to come. So um, that's what then kind of led to the local grassroots of TU in the Battenkill watershed to, to wonder how do we do this? How do we get a Battenkill Home Rivers Initiative and bring resources in that can really have a huge impact? So that's where the idea kind of started within the local chapters, the Battenkill Watershed Alliance, and ended up leading to bringing in a Battenkill watershed technician, which happened to be myself in 2019, to do a little bit more of the assessments that were needed to then kind of kickstart what could turn into a Home Rivers Initiative. So starting to identify the priority areas that we'd like to work and what some of the deficiencies are. So um, in that time that I was the technician, they were working behind the scenes to raise the initial funding for a Home Rivers Initiative, and um, that ended up coming to fruition. And in 2020, early 2020, we were able to officially launch, and I was hired full-time as the project coordinator for the Home Rivers Initiative. So since then, um, we've hit the ground running. We've planted over 1,500 trees, We've done about a mile of stream restoration work, reconnected almost two miles of cold water stream habitat, and um, trash removal has been huge too. Just recently, we removed 2,500 pounds of trash, and that's mostly just from public access areas along the river. So um, having an impact, engaging volunteers through that, um, and. I'm going to now move on to Jim, and Jim and John will talk a lot more about the nitty-gritty of the restoration work that we're doing. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, my name's Jim Henderson. I work for the Bennington County uh, Regional Commission as an environmental planner, and I'm a founding member of the Battenkill Watershed Alliance. Um, we've... Uh, the Watershed Alliance has been in existence since 2001. Um, we're a very low-key group of people that uh, um, do not recognize the state border when it comes to um, the watershed. Our membership uh, includes uh, people in both Vermont and New York. Um, our board of directors is comprised of uh, landowners who own river frontage, 
farmers, loggers, um, uh, municipal government people, and uh, just lay people who are very interested in uh, restoring the habitat of the river. Uh, we have zero overhead. Um, we're all volunteers, and um, we have an emphasis of trying to restore uh, trout habitat through Riverwood. <clears throat> Coming off of um, all the scientific studies that you heard about earlier today, uh, we made an, uh, an emphasis that uh, we're going to focus on Riverwood and our re restoration efforts. Uh, we started really working on in-stream projects, and I'm going to show you some of uh, some of those and some drawings that uh, I have to give Cynthia Browning some credit for. She took uh, some of Scott Wixom's uh, designs. Scott works for the Green Mountain National Forest. He's a fisheries biologist, and he, he helped us with a lot of our permitting and designs. And then Cynthia uh, put together um, this slideshow for one of our, um, our uh, annual meetings. And I should also give credit to Peter Bell and me, who uh, took a lot of the photos. So here's uh, what we would consider a good cross-section of a river. Um, there's a uh, riparian buffer, wooded uh, stream banks, and you can see that there's a variety of depth to this cross-section of a river where you have both very deep water and shallow water. Um, <clears throat> you have access to the floodplain on this side, so over high water, the, the water can get out of the river and dissipate its energy. It also has some structure in the bottom um, that provides some uh, shelter. <clears throat> this would be what we would consider a good pattern of a river flow where the water um, can, can go back and forth across from one bank to the other. Um, there's some structure in there and uh, as the water is, is going along the outside of the curves, it will take some of that sediment and then deposit it on the inside of the curves. So you get a variety of habitat in a very short river reach. <clears throat> now this is what we would consider a poor cross section, a poor river. Um, it might be really nice to wade this, but uh, you, it's not gonna be very productive uh, for fishing. Um, what generally happens is that the rivers get wider, the velocity of the stream slows down, so the deposits in the sediment of the, um, of the river load will settle out in the middle of the river, and then that would force the velocity and the volume of the river along the banks, creating erosion and then even more widening of the river. This is what we would like to avoid, <clears throat> and this is what often causes that to happen. Um, a straight shot uh, where the river has been either channelized or straightened. Sometimes it's been bermed to prevent uh, high water from coming into uh, agricultural fields, um, protecting infrastructure like bridges and roads. Uh, and so what you end up with is a high vo uh, velocity river, kind of like the um, fire hose effect and um, you don't get a whole lot of uh, good shelter habitat in this type of uh, river system. <clears throat> so what we do is we pick spots that, uh, that need to be enhanced with uh, in-stream habitat, and uh, this is an example of what we call a log rock vein, and uh, using heavy equipment and full-size trees and big boulders, we create structures that um, literally um, we've had a couple incredibly talented um, excavators, uh, Noel Dido, I should call out him, uh, on his big yellow machine in the middle of the river, he will take a full-size tree and jam it into the bank and then get it uh, anchored down with big boulders so it's stable. And this will um, create both a uh, shelter and for the fish and others, uh, animals, amphibians, but it also creates a different um, dynamic of the water and how the water reacts to it. And John will talk a little bit more better about um, the uh, river dynamics.
but it will change the flow and, and, uh, and subsequently how the river um, is formed. Here's a picture of Scott Wixom um, from the Green Mountain National Forest. He helped us with all of our designs and some of the permitting. Uh, we literally get a big machine in the river to do this work. Um, here's a picture of one of these uh, log rock veins. Uh, this is on um, a stretch that we refer to as the Twin Rivers, which is um, just downstream here a ways at the confluence of the Green River and the Battenkill. If you're a fisherman and you look at that, you know that there's fish under there uh, seeking shelter. Um, not only are they getting shelter from uh, predators, but they can also seek shelter through um, the weather events that happen. Um, high water, ice, and bright sunny days. They also allow fish to get solitude from each other as well, because um, sometimes fish need to separate themselves, either so they don't eat each other or they don't compete for the same resources. Another shelter or type of shelter that we build is called the convoy slide. And literally what we do is we take a complete tree or several trees and we lay, the, lay it in the middle of the stream so it is facing up and down in the current. And then we um, hold that structure down with big boulders. Here's another picture of Scott um, at one of these convoys. This is the, uh, the root wad, and the stem is facing upstream. And you can see how af after th they've been in place for a while, the, the current changes, and it will, uh, it will create a different uh, scouring effect of the stream bed itself. So because of this structure, you now have a much deeper pool and different um, types of water moving in a very short section of the stream. It's a lot deeper, it's a lot deeper next to the st uh, structure itself. <clears throat> Where we, sometimes what we start with is, a, in a, is an exposed bank where especially along an agricultural field, um, the entire bank will collapse and, uh, and we'll have exposed soil. So quite often what we'll, we'll do is build this bank bench or a bunker so that we can not only stabilize and stop that erosion and the collapse of the bank, but add the structure out into the river and then plant on top of what uh, we, on top of the inside of it where the original erosion occurred. So a, um, a fast moving shallow section of river uh, often leads to increased erosion and very little fish habitat. This is what we're trying to um, uh, fix. Here's the beginning of one of these um, benches where we first uh, will use um, logs and trees, stick them right into the bank then we'll bring in the rocks to hold them down. We'll cover this with soil and we'll start doing some planting on top of that. We know that um, we're not going to be able to fix everything. We also know that this type of work costs a lot of money. And um, shortly about the time when Ken Cox was retiring, he pulled me aside and he said, Jim, everything that you guys have been doing in the river is great. It's working. It costs a lot of money. What the river really needs is more trees, more trees planted. You cannot plant too many trees along the river. And, um, and the board of the Watershed Alliance completely agrees. It, um, and it's relatively simple and easy to do. This is one of the first plantings that we did um, in conjunction with the uh, Bennington County Conservation District. This is up in Manchester. And subsequent from this, we've planted thousands of trees, um, mostly on the main stem. In the last couple of years, I've started to focus more of my planting efforts on the Green River. 
Um, I'm fortunate that uh, I got a good partnership with uh, the, an organization called 350 Vermont, and they are partnered with the Arbor Day Foundation. So I've been getting, uh, for the last two years, a variety of native plants uh, at no cost, and uh, the only condition being that we plant them on rivers. This is a, a site that we planted in Manchester, um, up near uh, where uh, Richville Road and River Road intersect. Um, Burn Burton students were really helpful in doing uh, this planting with me. Many hands makes light work. <clears throat> and here's a list of uh, all the other partners. In, in my opinion, I think the Watershed Alliance has kind of made a shift in the last few years uh, away from doing these bigger in-stream projects to more of a coordinating effort, in my opinion. Um, we're, we're, the, we're the ones who make connections between the landowners and the, and the other agencies and other partners that we work on. In my opinion, that's one of our biggest um, and most important roles, and I'm really happy to do that. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to John now, and he'll talk a little bit more in detail Incidentally, I do have, um, I just got an order of 500 trees of different varieties. And if anybody wants some trees to plant along the river, sign up at my table next door. We'll also take new memberships too. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jim. <clears throat> uh, can you folks hear me okay? Okay. Um, so, uh, my perspective is going to come uh, a little bit different. I may be using a little bit more technical language, and I apologize, uh, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, I'm a retired physician, and I've been doing uh, geomorphic uh, restoration work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife for over 20 years. And prior to that, I was doing it with uh, some other um, restoration experts. Oops, did I do that? Uh, okay, so that's basically me, and, and we're just going to talk about some things that have been done. Okay, so healthy, high-functioning streams, they're no accident. They are self-formed, self-adjusting, under ordinary high water conditions, occurs about twice a year. It's physics in moving bed load and large wood. They're highly resilient. They're dynamically stable. They provide the best ecosystem services, <clears throat> both in-stream and alongside. Best fit for all aquatic life cycles from egg to adult, bugs to trout. They're most aesthetically pleasing. And if you look at a functional level from the EPA, you know, they will score uh, very high in all five levels of stream functioning uh, within this proceeds, this assessment proceeds from the watership all the way down to stream reaches and segments, things that uh, Jacob and I did back in 2019 in the assessments. Okay, and, and that's just a, a lead into this pyramid where the lower functions, the lower levels have to support what we're really interested in as anglers is the biologic functions. Do we have abundant trout, good year classes, large fish, and do we have abundant hatchets and of a good variety? Okay, but it's all supported by water quality and such. So uh, I won't say any more about that. It, but uh, just go on. Healthy natural streams, then under ordinary annual high waters, move normal bed loads, sands, gravels, <clears throat> cobbles, and they recruit and shift large wood. They maintain good pool and riffle diversity in the associated habitats. Uh, they uh, <clears throat> maintain active floodplains by, they rebuild floodplains continuously by depositing fines. And they do so by maintaining their bed elevations. They don't cut down and they don't build up. The banks erode, but fractions of an inch per year. Can you believe that, folks? Fractions of an inch per year. Easily provable and demonstrated <coughs> everywhere. Rarely impacted by floods, and they're cheap to keep. Self-maintaining. This is a, um, a riffle <coughs> run system or step pool system, moderate gradient. That dotted line, that's the ordinary high water that forms and maintains a healthy stream. It has to hit that with frequency. This is a valley bottom stream. 
bankful elevation is associated with the sands you see in the foreground. Okay, and, um, and this is a riffle pool system. Now, you'll notice that red line up at the top, Top of, tropical storm Irene flood crest, five days afterward. That's 10 feet from Bankful up to where that went through. We could see all the, the grasses in a layer up there. By the way, did you notice? I have one criticism that this otherwise high quality reference reach, it doesn't have any wood. It needs wood, okay? So it's habitat deficient in that context. There's a nice example of a valley bottom stream with an abundance of large wood naturally recruited. Poor functioning streams are highly unstable. They are either incising or infilling their beds, and usually they're doing both in different stretches. They are eroding their banks, could be three, 10, sometimes up to 30 feet. I haven't seen that much. Evolting new channels, they cut, rip across new channels, cut off meander bends, they produce excess sediment loads, result in shallow pools and embedded riffles. Uh-oh, not good for trout, not good for bugs. They're destructive and they're costly. They are high maintenance and their floods become a non nonsense monster. On a human scale, could they resolve themselves and get back to normal conditions? And they can't. They become increasingly barren and devoid of fish and hatches. But over a long term, if we just stop doing things around the, bend, the banks, stop constricting them with roads and so forth like that, they would, in the absence of mankind, they would get back to normal. They would simply re resolve and revise themselves because they are, streams are sometimes referred to as the carpenter uh, of their own edifice. They are always continually adjusting. Okay, whoops. I, sorry? Okay, channels simplification, and we did this, I don't mean me personally, but I mean me as a part of humankind. And land use, it drives most instability seen in tribs. Tree removal reduces bank strength at least a thousand fold. Depends on the substrate in your bank. Narrowing the river's corridor with roads, roads bridges, and berms just gives you excess energy which is going to cause incision and then bank erosion. It's gonna lower your water table and sometimes even dry up miles of streams. Amazing, I'll show you an example. And the results in that excess sediment overloading has got additional problems. By the way, if we lose wetlands in an alluvial system and we have more more development, what happens? You will wind up with flashier fudge, higher peaks coming through with higher energy you'll also wind up with lower base flows. And base flows for the summer are critical to prevent um, uh, summer kills, particularly in New York, which doesn't have as much cold water as you guys got. Okay, this is White Creek. White Creek is a trib of the, in the bat kill system. And, and clearly, there's a massive amount of sediment. It's way beyond the, the transport capacity. It was caused by upstream incision, okay, which was related to an undersized bridge. Here is an entirely dry bed of Camden Creek, which is a wild brook trout stream, and 1.7 miles goes seasonally bone dry. Again, it's a bridge that did it. Using large wood, we regard it as our kind of first violin in the orchestra in stream and habitat work. It's an essential tool to help us uh, promote recovery. It's our least cost option. It's most effective and least risk. It's got multiple benefits, trapping sediment, providing cover and shelter, and scouring out new habitat. The benefits of trapping sediment are phenomenal as we, we learned on a stream that I will show you shortly. Uh, we also, if we have a wide enough valley floor, uh, it works really well putting it uh, in the river like in Vermont, but even when we have an oversized river, we can help shrink it down as Jim had alluded to. Where else can we use large wood? Well, we can use it if the stream is not in size, which means the top of the low bank is bankful or that channel forming, okay, and it's got the little sandy deposit. If it has access to an a wide enough 
floodplain. And if it, the streams are small, okay, under 35 feet or under 30 feet, and as the wider valley I mentioned as well, uh, so it can get some of the flood energy out. Okay, this, this was over widened because of those double wing deflectors which were on a diagram that Jim uh, didn't exactly mention. But the double wing deflectors, <clears throat> okay, it goes over and then it goes this way. So it was ripping the banks and make it wider. Would you live there as a trout? No. Would you fish there as if you were an angler? Not if you're a novice, maybe, but not if you're an angler. Okay, and this is what we did. We put in those uh, root wide veins that Jim described. Okay, narrowed, roughened the stream. The, sh the finds are now, okay, being deposited out there. Notice the greenery. That greenery is self recruited sycamores and willows. Excellent trout recovery. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I put, there we go. This is a, uh, a series of step pools made with logs on a steep restriction of a small uh, brook trout stream. And uh, we get these nice, beautiful, deep step pools. We put five of them in there because we, we had to step it down. Um, this is uh, on the lower batten kill. And it's a tow wood structure. We used it because we had an eight foot high bank uh, that was vertical and, and contributing many tons of sediment per year. And we're just, uh, we're in there a week ago or so uh, doing uh, tree planting. Um, we'll, uh, we've got a little bit more work to do next summer. Uh, sorry. Yeah, a absolutely. In this particular case, um, in this particular case, uh, there really was no pool there. Okay, so we actually had to excavate a pool. Okay, uh, and then we excavated uh, a, a submerged bench, and we built uh, related to all the wood went there. So it's all buried. Okay, and then we had multiple uh, coconut fiber wrapped soil lifts to get us up to Bankful. You see with that, um, the front edge, you know, actually the front edge of that, you can't see it's under two feet of water, but that's half Bankful. This is Bankful where the person in red is standing, and that extends back about 15, about, excuse me, 20, 25 feet. And then we taper that up to the existing terrace. So we're giving access to flood energy. It can go across the, the river, but it also can come this way now, okay? And yeah, so we have lots of wood down there and we're gonna deepen that pool a little bit more. So um, yeah, we'll pick up nice habitat and a much flatter pool in this run that you see in this photo. This was at 2000 CFS, by the way. Uh, bankful, that's about half bankful. Uh, okay, this is Camden Creek. This is below that dry section. And um, we've got wooded tow wood on the bends. Fish and Wildlife said, John, what you need to do is you need to re-meander this, put tow wood on the sides, put in some uh, uh, great control using boulders, give uh, reconnect it to a floodplain, and then go ahead and do your replanting. And I said, geez, you mean I got to do all that, Carl? That's going to be hard. Well, we did it, and it came out really, really well. Problem was we knew it had too much sediment moving down, down channel. Okay, and it was coming from upstream problems. So we, uh, we asked uh, um, Dan uh, McKinley and one of his associates to come out and take a look at it uh, upstream. And uh, we put in large wood with the intent, the express intent of trapping sediment. We knew we would get scour holes, okay, for trout, but we would also trap lots of sediment. By trapping lots of sediment, it didn't impact that downstream geomorphic restoration. You know, so that's perfect. This is perfect. You know, large wood is absolutely a key element. Okay, we can use it in multiple, multiple ways. And the last one really is not a wood-related project. It's a reconnection project. Now, most reconnections, we'd like to take out a culvert. And um, we couldn't, under this circumstance, so we were asked uh, by the Sound County Soil Water Conservation District in uh, Washington County, New York, 
if we could um, just rewater up into and through the, uh, the culvert. <clears throat> and I said, oh, yeah, I know what needs to be done, but I got to get Carl out here to give me some steerage because I haven't done one of these. So we did it. <clears throat> uh, and it's a series of step pools, okay, and we raised that bed up. Um, we raised it about this much so that we could rewater that. That is now two years post. This photograph was taken uh, one week ago, today. Uh, and it's functioning beautiful. And yes, there are trout there. And yes, trout can now uh, migrate upstream and uh, spawn for an additional mile of stream at least. I'm going to try this. Let me know if it works. Otherwise, I'll go to the mic. But generally speaking, I hate to do this when I'm doing a presentation, but sometimes it's necessary. I'm Joe Mark. Uh, I am kind of the odd man out here. I am not going to talk about stream restoration hardly at all. I'm going to talk about the fact that you, you, me, you, 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 most of us in this room have gray hair. And uh, that's true of a lot of uh, what's going on in nationwide in terms of uh, stream work. I'm interested in getting some young people uh, to develop the same passions and concerns that, that John and Jim have. I'm talking about the uh, Trout the Classroom program, which is a national program uh, supported by Trout Unlimited, although Trout Unlimited is not the only sponsor in Vermont. It is the primary sponsor in conjunction with the uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And uh, there are 3,000 schools across the country in 30 states that uh, help teachers and kids raise trout, in our case, brook trout, for six months of the year. It's a very demanding project. Uh, a lot of trout die. A lot of people have nightmares worrying about their trout, including me. And uh, overall, it uh, is, is, is something that requires, especially of teachers, an amazing amount of, of, of commitment. But along the way, uh, kids learn about the importance of habitat, of streams, of floodplains, of the uh, canopy coverage of the substrate under those streams in ways that I never knew until I was about 65 years old. Uh, I, I, nothing pleases me more than to listen to a third grader explain the nitrogen cycle to her parents, and they do. Uh, so we're very interested in, in cold water conservation and water quality, and you can't raise trout in the classroom without learning about that. There are five team chapters in Vermont. We are in the southwestern Vermont chapter area, and uh, each of them has a person designated to support schools in that area that are trying to raise trout. I say trying because no, but they don't always succeed. I am the state coordinator, but also the regional coordinator for the southwestern Vermont area. Uh, when I got involved in 2012, there were five schools doing this uh, at the height of our uh, development. Just before the pandemic, we hit 99. Uh, this year, remarkably, in spite of the risks of school closures and things of that sort, we still have 85 uh, teachers and kids doing it. That's what it looks like across the year. Basically, you start in November and you finish up in June. And um, the highlight is, is the learning that takes place. It's not just about keeping an aquarium healthy. You could do that with probably uh, guppies. But it's about uh, learning about the larger context of stream ecology, threats to water quality, threats to the species, including for fisher people like us, uh, and, and kids get very invested in this. They, uh, um, many teachers tell me that some, some of the least invested kids, I'll pick on boys, because I'm one, uh, five-year-old boys who are tuning out of school almost entirely become the ones that want to come in before class to see how the fish are doing. It just really engages a lot of kids. We get our eggs from the Roxbury hatchery, that's what it used to look like, that's what it looks like now after I read. There's a lot of water testing involved. Uh, basically every other day, uh, the kids have to test the water. We're particularly concerned, oh, has, uh, 
little uh, change in format. Uh, particularly concerned about ammonia and nitrite, which in, in, in the space of two or three days could rise to levels that would wipe out a whole tank full of fish. As I said, the nitrogen cycle uh, is, is one of the core learnings that comes out of this program, but it's more than a science program. Teachers use this uh, to uh, get kids to take numbers seriously, to learn averages, to plot graphs and things of that sort. They uh, have kids drawing elements of what, you know, what does an embryo look like under the skin, and uh, writing stories about the fish, making songs up, writing uh, poems, performing poems. This is obviously a school that connected its fine arts program to the travel classroom program. Uh, we have a national excuse me, quilt project, and it's kind of cool. Each school, uh, each kid makes an eight by eight inch uh, quilt square. They send those off to 24 other schools across the country with a letter about their school and their habitat. They get a letter back from another school with a set of quilt squares. They put them all together and they've got this uh, transnational quilt. Some of our schools, bring in volunteers to dissect fish. Others uh, teach fly casting or fly tying. And uh, the ones who can, the ones who are close enough to a stream, like Fisher Elementary School here in Arlington, can walk their kids to a stream. They can do field work all year long, from August uh, to June, uh, doing analyses of what's going on in the stream. Most schools aren't that fortunate, so they've reserved those activities for release day. Our organization, Trout Unlimited, uh, provides the support, the infrastructure, the recruitment, the grant writing. We uh, have an annual training program for teachers and volunteers. We have a manual, many some of our data manual to help them. We have a lot of online resources and a website, and uh, we have human supports. This is the Vermont Travel Classroom website. Uh, I uh, would remind many activities for six months of the year to write this. TIC blog, trying to update uh, the schools on what's going on around the state, share ideas about curriculum and innovative practices, etc. There's also a national travel limited website. Uh, you've heard the word partnership uh, from both Jim and John. We uh, promote partnerships as well, and some of the same cast of characters. Obviously, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department, the Forest Service, but uh, also Audubon societies can be an important partner, especially in, in helping schools learn about the importance of the riparian zone. Uh, regional conservation districts, watershed alliances, uh, many of our schools have found ways to reach out to those local organizations and engage those participants, those volunteers for those organizations with their kids and help teach their kids uh, oftentimes out in the field. In a few instances, we have universities nearby and in those cases, of course, we try to tap into the faculty to uh, raise the level of education for our uh, students. How am I doing on time, Cal? I'd start to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just very quickly, uh, we are in the Bathkill watershed. We've got, uh, here's a map of what that looks like. Uh, we have five schools that are doing travel in the classroom in this area. Um, and uh, the three in red are either doing trout in the classroom, I'm sorry, are, are doing something that relates uh, to the back hill. Uh, I mentioned Fisher Elementary, that's here at Arlington. Maple Street School is on the southwest side of Manchester, and Burke Burton Academy is on the south side of Manchester. And uh, I, I had Shaftesbury on the list, but I'm going to cross them off because they're not in the back hill watershed. So, the goal is to make these kids uh, lovers of watersheds, right? And we can start as early as preschool. This is a book that a lot of our younger uh, grades use. It's fantastic. You should read it. You'd learn something from it, you might. Uh, try to relate to read. But there are resources of every, uh, for, for every group possible. And it, this is an example of an Audubon Society talking about the riparian zone to a group of uh, it was fourth graders in that case. Here's a group of kids in third grade that are uh, using a kick net to collect macroinvertebrates, and those, that's what they got, and they're classifying them and using that to evaluate the health of that stream. Maple Street School in Manchester has the great good fortune of being right on the banks of the backfield. My pointer is too weak to work, but 
This is the back hill. Uh, Munson Brook, which is a tributary, comes in. It runs right on the edge of the Maple Street School uh, campus. So they can get their kids into the water every single day if they want to. They are um, one of the few schools that has a what's called a Mayfly sensor. It's now in the viral DIY. Jacob, here's Jacob, Fetterman, checking the installation of the uh, device. It's a small box like this, solar powered, and it allows uh, probes to be put in the stream, uploaded to the cloud. And this morning I had my iPhone, I was checking the temperature and the, and the water height of the bath kill at that location. Another way to get kids. Uh, not only invested in their watershed, but uh, learning about the technology that allows them to study. Uh, this was a few days ago, the backfill had dropped from just under 50 to 43.9. Bird Bird Academy, a couple of representatives here today. I think you've seen this photograph of the cleanup. Here's a group of them that did um, tree plantings. We try to get kids out for rent surveys in, in late October and November. Um, Jacob has developed a hard copy data sheet for that, but we also have an application uh, that could be used on any smartphone that allows you to log a red, uh, attach GPS coordinates, a photograph, a description, etc. Uh, here's a nice photograph of red. Here are kids looking for red on, on, on two different uh, Vermont streets. So, I hope I didn't speak too fast for you, but uh, we got started a little late and it's now time for Jacob. Unless you have a question. We just we have one minute for questions. <coughs> or we can just do them all. Yeah, at the end. So I also don't need to talk too much about all this stuff, but I wanted to at least kind of highlight some of the science too behind the work that we're doing. Uh, temperature monitoring is a really important part of our work to make sure that it's suitable for trout in the first place to be working in a given area. And we have aspirations of improving our temperature monitoring program. But pictured here are data points from each of our, I think, 29 sites. Um, between New York and Vermont from last year and the chapters in New York, the Clearwater and Adirondack chapter are really um, super involved. They do more of the work on that than I do. I just get the data from them at the end of the season and can put it onto the map. But recently we also got a bunch of temperature loggers for the Vermont portion of the watershed as well. And last year, definitely cooler year, so you really didn't start to see any kind of borderline stress until much lower in the watershed. And even then, last year, we saw good temperatures really throughout. We're also doing, as Joe mentioned, spawning surveys, and that data is being mapped from year to year. So we have now two years of decent data um, down here you can see last year with that cooler water was higher flows so that complicated our ability to really get out and uh, count reds effectively. So we saw less reds last year but there's more factors than just how many fish are actually spawning and where. And we're also doing some snorkel surveys, as well as working with the state agencies um, doing electrofishing surveys. So in the absence of being able to get them out there for a survey, uh, I've actually done some snorkel surveys of Camden Creek and the East Branch of the Batten Kill, and counting trout and estimating size based on um, some pre kind of um, not thinking of the right word, but calibration. So calibrating my eye to what length something might be and then using it on the actual fish in the stream. So the top right you could see a really pretty nice brook trout that was probably in the about 10 inch range. And then all those estimates uh, can be put together for the number, approximate number of trout per mile and in after following our restoration project that John showed a picture of on Camden Creek, DEC did electrofishing before and after, and those are the top two. The date I actually messed up for the second line, but that was just last year in September. 
and um, the number of adult trout per mile actually went down very slightly, um, as well as the yois, but um, that was also following the big July 29th storm, a little bit different time of year, so there's even variables in this data. Um, but the big highlight, um, the DEC survey is actually kind of on the tail end of where we did our project. So the bottom line is where I snorkeled through the, the actual like, area where John showed the tow wood, the nice meanders and deep pools, and there we saw over a thousand trout per mile. So um, that was really neat to see and that's where all of those pictures that you see here were taken. And just to highlight an ongoing fundraising effort that we're doing right now, the Home River's open and it's running through May 30th is the last day to sign up but we have prizes for that. Um, the grand prize is an Orvis Helios 3 uh, rod that was donated. There's a lot of guided trips with locals on the bat and kill. And um, so good way to raise money for the work that we're doing and get people out on the water this spring. So if you wanna sign up, there's actually registration over at the booths in the fitness center.